that uh, it was after October 25th when the Agena itself failed on the Gemini 6 launch that uh, you fellows out there plunged in and built uh, this device out of, uh, well, really almost scrap that you had around there from old Gemini spacecraft. Uh, the control system, uh, the attitude control system on this uh, target vehicle is indeed uh, part of the, I believe, the re-entry control system of the Gemini 6, the same one that Stafford flew in space. And in uh, uh, and, and real truth, this target vehicle is a blood brother of the Gemini spacecraft, uh, uh, related far closer to that than it is to the Agena it replaced. Uh, it uh, has many of the features and characteristics, uh, uh, parts at any rate, not characteristics, flight characteristics of the Gemini. The main thing is, as you fellows yourselves have reported out there, it doesn't have the propulsion system, and we're going to be a little bit behind after this mission, even as successful as it promises to be, uh, since we will not have had, even in Gemini 8 or Gemini 9, the chance to practice with that propulsion system of the Agena which in effect is a test of a means of sense refueling in space, of getting an added boost from uh, rockets already put up there, spacecraft put up there, and waiting for a manned craft. CBS News color coverage of Gemini 9 will continue in a moment. <laughs> the rain tire. No, but we have something just as good. Uh-uh. It's got to be the rain tire. Do you have the rain tire? Mister, we have all kinds of precipitation tires. Hail tires, sleet tires, slush tires, drizzle tires, smog, and fog tires. No, thanks. I want the rain tire. Do you have the rain tire? Yes, sir. We're U.S. Royal. The only ones who have the rain tire. And it costs about the same as ordinary tires. This tire... Look, look, look. I'm sold. Put them on. That's the one. This is Walter Cronkite, back at our CBS News Space Center at Cape Kennedy, one of our three uh, CBS News Space Centers for this flight of Gemini 9. Here, St. Louis at McDonnell Aircraft, where we have our mock-up of the spacecraft and the target vehicle and the spacewalk, and in uh, New York, where we will be covering the recovery of the, uh, of the Gemini 9, scheduled for an Atlantic splashdown on Saturday morning after three days in space. Three days which will include the dramatic highlight tomorrow morning of a two and a half hour spacewalk by this 32 year old pilot of the uh, Gemini 9, Eugene Cernan, youngest man yet to go into space. If all goes well, Stafford and Cernan in Gemini 9 are to catch the ATDA and dock with it within four and a half hours this afternoon. Using an exclusive CBS News animation, let's take a look at the various steps leading up to that docking in space. Now, after the Titan booster roars off from Cape Kennedy, astronauts Tom Stafford and Gene Cernan aboard will be inserted into orbit in a little more than six minutes. At that time, their orbital speed will be 17,500 miles an hour, and uh, they will have achieved orbit. The chase of the Agena target vehicle begins. A 70,000-mile chase will be completed on the third orbit, one orbit sooner than uh, before in the other Gemini mission. Initially, the ATDA will be in circular orbit 185 miles high. It's achieved that now. Gemini in elliptical orbit 100 by 168 miles. Gemini behind by some 700 miles. 50 minutes after liftoff, the first Gemini maneuver takes place. The spacecraft nears its first apogee then, or its high point. The thrusters are fired and the catch-up rate is reduced. At this time, Gemini trails the target by 480 miles. And this shows how the two orbits are changed in relation to each other by that first Gemini maneuver. Now, one hour and six minutes later, the second maneuver takes place. That adjusts the catch-up rate again, the altitude, and it brings the Gemini closer to the target uh, plane. Now, Gemini trails its target by a little more than 200 miles. And again, our animation shows how the firing of the Gemini thrusters will affect the relationship between the two spacecraft. 
You see how the Gemini is now at one point touching the orbit of the other. Now comes a third and very important Gemini maneuver, two hours and 20 minutes into the flight, near the high point on the second revolution of the Earth. This purpose, to circularize finally that Gemini orbit at 168 miles high. That's 168 miles nautical, or 185 miles statute miles, and bring it into the same orbit approximately. Take that back, that's 168 statute miles. It brings it into the same orbit as the target vehicle, but below it. It's 150 miles behind and 17 miles below now. Now it's time for the radar to send out signals, lock on to the receiving transponder on the target. And it's almost two and a half hours into the flight, and the terminal phase of the final catch-up's beginning. The Gemini spacecraft is closing rapidly on its target. As night falls, the Gemini crew can see a light aboard the target vehicle there in the distance, as you notice. Now Gemini moves in. The onboard computers helping the crew make small corrective burns. The radar is functioning also. Finally, as the range closes to less than five miles, the crew begins a semi-optical approach to the target. That means they look at it, but they also use their instruments. Rendezvous will be achieved over the Indian Ocean near Australia. Now, when the Gemini spacecraft and the target are only about 50 feet apart, they'll start flying in formation. That is, just 50 feet apart, they'll fly around the world at 17,500 miles an hour until the actual docking begins over Hawaii. Now, slowly, the Gemini will close the final few feet until it nudges together with the target. Moves in there. Wallace Ross said it's about like parking your car in a garage. But the vehicles are moving 17,500 miles an hour. However, at this point, in their relative speed, it's just about a third of a mile an hour. And into the docking collar. That has to be done slowly and carefully, of course. The Gemini 8 proved docking could be done, and the Gemini 9 crew are confident they're going to be successful. In actuality, there'll be more than one docking exercise in this flight. There are going to be a total of nine. And the maneuver is going to be repeated many times to give these pilots, Stafford and CERN, a chance to try their hand and their skill at it. So this will be a familiar configuration for a good part of the flight of Gemini 9. You've seen how docking's accomplished now. Well, with the flight of Gemini 9, the launch here some 13, 14 minutes away. The countdown is T minus 11 or 10 now of 1057, but there's a three minute hold in there. So it's about uh, 13 minutes and 52 seconds to launch. Jack Siegel at IBM standing by to explain the relation of speed and altitude in these complicated maneuvers. Jack? Walter, we have a couple of displays, demonstrations that we can use to give you an idea of the relationship of speed versus altitude. Here, the computer has generated a display showing the Earth in the center and three Gemini spacecraft at various orbital levels. Now, let's start them in motion. And you'll see almost immediately that the one closest to Earth is moving fastest. The one furthest away is moving slowest. Now, let's stop for a minute to give you a better look. This is not because the one closest to Earth has the least distance to travel. It is actually moving faster. It has to move faster to stay away from the pull of gravity. It is continually falling in towards the Earth. The gravity attraction is stronger here, and so it moves the fastest to counteract that. Now, we have another display over here, a demonstration that we can use to give you an idea of the relationship of speed versus altitude. This surface has been shaped so that a ball moving around it acts somewhat like a planet moving around the sun or a satellite around the Earth. The surface is something like a wide cone and the velocity that this ball has helps it stay up and counteract the pull of gravity. The surface friction of the ball and the cone actually act like the Earth's atmosphere to take velocity away from it and it gradually goes back down in towards the Earth. Now let me show, here is for instance the ATDA in a high circular orbit and here's the Agena. Now watch, you'll see the Agena is caught up, it is passed, now it is catching up again. Anything in a lower orbit is moving faster. We're able to get this across fairly easily with this demonstration. Now Walter, we have one other thing that we can show you. Down in Houston recently, I was explaining this conical surface demonstration to astronaut Tom Stafford and trying to describe it to him. And he said, well, why don't you show something else that anybody can do in their home? So here's something for any of your viewers. 